So will you just take a moment and welcome Pastor Joseph Matera as he comes to minister to us today? Thank you. It's a great joy to be here. Uh, what a great church, a great group of uh, leaders, and I love Pastor Ben and his family. And this church has a history of, of giving a biblical plumb line for solid foundational teaching. And Pastor Ben has continued that, preaching the uncompromised word of God with balance in a world that's filled with extremes and chaos, right? So why don't you give your pastor a hand for that? I'll tell you, I'm excited. As he mentioned, there, is a, there are a few books. I got 13. So if you go to josephmatera.org, my website, there's a lot of books. Just coming out with a book we'll be promoting. It's almost uh, 400 pages on the global apostolic movement and the progress of the gospel. For those of you interested in that sort of thing, go on Amazon. It's already up. Uh, this book was the first book ever written. It helped shift a lot of people in the body of Christ towards understanding the kingdom of God instead of just an individual salvation message. It's out of print, and some people told me that in some places it's actually being sold for $500. It's pretty funny. I probably have about 1,000 of these left. Uh, but, you know, $15, if you can't afford it, give whatever you want or promise to, to read it and just take it. Uh, I'm never doing anything for money. This thing came out. A year ago to help correct some of the wacky prophetic things going on in the body of Christ. It's called the purpose, power, and process of prophetic ministry. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, things in this book I could talk about, but uh, I, I want to have enough time to minister the word, but a lot of people have read this, using it to train prophetic ministry in their church, and it has a strong identity with the local church as opposed to some of the social media prophets that are out there. So it's another book, very practical, uh, normally goes for about $20, the same thing. Uh, if you're going to read it and you don't have the money, just take it or give whatever you can or pray and ask God to tell you what to give. One time I said that in a church and the lady gave me $1,000 for one book. And I said, all right, praise God, you know, <laughs> do what the Lord leads. That's probably better than even selling it for a price. But Lord, we pray that you'd bless this word now. And we pray that you would help us to understand the things that you want to convey, that there be a deposit that will help build on the foundation of this great church and even uh, bring even a greater shift in the ways you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about the book of Acts and how the book of Acts can be called a book of prayer. If you look at... Uh, the Gospel of Luke, which is part one of the Lucan authorship of these two inspired books. Luke, the companion, the doctor who accompanied Paul throughout his journeys, wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then part two, connected to it, is the book of Acts. And if you read it in that way, you'll understand the book of Acts a lot more. And so in both of these writings, Luke and Acts, uh, you could see the importance that Luke placed in prayer. In the book, Gospel of Luke, for example, more than any other gospel, we see Jesus going in desolate places and spending all night in prayer. He focused on the prayer life of Jesus. It was in Luke 11 where Luke cites the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't ask him, teach us to cast out demons, to preach, to heal, uh, to teach us about public speaking. They didn't ask him any of that because they knew the secret of his power was his prayer life. And so in the Gospel of Luke, we see that focus on prayer, among other things. In the book of Acts, we see how the church was thrust into their missionary ventures uh, primarily through not only gospel proclamation, but we see that almost every important aspect of the growth of the church was preceded by either individual or corporate prayer. So in the book of Acts, we start with chapter 1, and 
we see that they came together right before Jesus was to ascend into heaven. He had been walking with them post-resurrection for 40 days and 40 nights. And these were his last words. He said to them, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And previous to that, they asked him if he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel because they were very, um, you know, disappointed in all of the persecution. Their Lord and Savior was crucified. And up until that point, they still didn't understand the nature of the kingdom of God. They thought it was political. They thought it was about seizing power, uh, very similar to a lot of the Christians today. They think it's about political power, seizing power, so that they're not persecuted instead of just primarily being gospel-centered, and that's how they were. They would say, hey, you know, we don't want to be chased around by these religious leaders and by the Romans. We don't want to be subservient to them. Are you going to take the kingdom now? And Jesus answered them very, very uh, profoundly. He talked about power, but not in the same way they were looking for it. He said, you shall receive power. See, they were asking for political power. He said, you're going to receive power. But it's going to come through the Holy Spirit that comes upon you. And as a result of that power, he didn't say anything about speaking in tongues. A lot of times Pentecostals just focus on speaking in tongues. He said, but you will be my witnesses. Now notice he didn't say you'll have the ability to heal and to preach. He never disconnected the individual person from their ministry. In other words, to the extent that you personally are walking with God and representing him, to that extent will you have power and represent him. He said, you will be my witness. He didn't say you will be a witness. He didn't say you'll be able to preach. You notice the nuance there? He said, you will be my witnesses. And so the power of Christ comes on us so that even in our humanity, we are a witness of him. We're not just the witness when we take missionary trips to Haiti, when we give out tracts, when we put bumper stickers on our car, uh, when we try to you know, give out food in the pantry. We are supposed to be his witness when we drive our kids to school, when we're hanging out with our family. Uh, you get the picture every time, you know, every waking moment, every part of our life. We're supposed to be his witness. And that's the purpose of the power of the Spirit. The focus in classical Pentecostalism has always been, well, you get, you know, you speak in tongues. Well, tongues could be a sign, but the primary thing is that we ourselves are the witness. And that's what it's all about. And uh, this is what this generation is looking for. They're looking not for institutional Christianity as much as genuine Christianity, relational Christianity, authentic Christianity, humble Christianity that doesn't try to seize power and lead from the top down, but from the bottom up. Jesus said that uh, as I wash feet, so should you wash feet. So Jesus, mo Jesus modeled leadership as a servant leader, even though he was God. He didn't think uh, grasping equality with God was something to be desired, but he took upon himself the form of a servant. And he began as a slave, basically, serving other people. And because he was humble and obedient even till death on the cross, God highly exalted him. The church today is the opposite. They try to take power, take cities, instead of loving cities and serving cities the way Jesus did. And if that means being a servant in political leadership, that's fine. But have a servant attitude. Don't try to take it. Don't try to seize power. Try to mimic Christ in everything you do, even in politics, right? And so the gospel uh, commission, the great commission, we see a periscope of that in Luke. Uh, he told them to wait in the city until they're clothed with power from on high. That's what they were doing. We see in John chapter 20, he said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. How did the Father send Jesus? That was more incarnational. Jesus 
Even though he's God, he became human. And so part of the Great Commission there was being present in our communities, being present. As the Father sent Jesus, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, John 1, 14. So are we to be sent? We're to be present, not just preaching and proclaiming and having a dualistic life where we live one way on Sunday, a different way on Monday. No, no, no. How you are in your business with your family is part of being sent, dwelling amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, he was full of grace and truth all the time, not just when he was in the synagogue unpacking the book of Isaiah. How many understand what I'm saying here? Matthew 28, he said, make disciples of all the nations. And uh, some people use that to uh, categorize uh, political involvement in a way where Jesus meant change geopolitics in nations, but the word nations in that uh, orientation, even though it's corporate, has to do with ethnic groups, people groups. It wasn't a geopolitical construct that's only 500 years old. And so how did he make disciples? He said, baptizing them, meaning you change people groups by getting individuals in the church by being initiated by water baptism and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you that has to do with catechism, that has to do with learning the first principles of the gospel. So the only way you change nations is through people joining the local church through baptism and teaching. You don't change nations just by political involvement. That's where some of the church right now has gone off a deep end. They bypass the local church and think that that is discipling nations when Jesus made it clear. No, they have to get baptized and catechized. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then we have the Mark 16 Great Commission aspect where he says that those who believe in my name will cast out demons. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So that has to do with cleaning people up. That has to do with moving into power gifts. And uh, so we see all of this together, coupled with, I would add, a fifth periscope of the Great Commission, which hardly anybody mentions, is Acts chapter 1. He said, you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And then he said, Jerusalem. Jerusalem stands for a place of what we would call homogeneous culture, where People look like you, talk like you, share the same values, the same culture, the same food. So what Jesus is saying there is first start off in your immediate family, in your immediate community. If you can't reach your community, how are you going to reach Africa and China, right? So first be a good gospel witness as a church in your community. Serve your community. Then he says, secondarily, Judea. Judea stands for a church that is continually expanding, not just reach your community, but by implication, be apostolic and continue to be uh, expansive. Apostles were chosen by Jesus because they were the entrepreneurs. They were the pioneers. They were the people who expanded territory. They were the people who didn't just think locally, but they thought extra locally. Jesus didn't choose 12 apostles prophets or 12 pastors or 12 teachers. He chose 12 apostles because the church is supposed to be missional and expansive, always planning, always moving, always raising up disciples, always raising up new people. And so by implication, that was a challenge for the church not to be static and stay in Jerusalem. And unfortunately, they wanted to just minister to Jews. They wanted to just minister to people just like them. And God had to allow a persecution in Acts chapter 8 so that those who preach, who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. And it resulted in them going to Samaria. And then eventually in Acts chapter 11, they went to Antioch. And that began the great missionary endeavor where they reached the whole world. And so we see him calling us to go to Judea. That's a challenge for us to develop leaders, to plant churches. I believe this church is called to be an apostolic church an apostolic center that eventually starts planning a bunch of churches, utilizes the gifts, the entrepreneurial gifts of your pastor so he doesn't get bored, and starts uh, uh, endeavors in different parts of the state and maybe beyond the state, right? 
And then you have the challenge to go to Samaria. Now, that was a huge challenge because the Jews hated the Samaritans. You can look at the uh, narrative in John chapter 4 where the woman at the well was shocked that Jesus would speak to him. Number one, because was she was a woman. Number two, because she was Samaritan and the Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans because there was a history of hatred because they were a mixed breed. They were half Jewish, half uh, Assyrian or other uh, et uh, ethnic group. And uh, they had a different expression of the Judaistic religion that was in was abhorrent to the Jews. So there was a lot of historical animosity. If you want to check out the genesis of that, go to 2 Kings chapter 15, and you can look at that, 15 and 16. But uh, what we see is Jesus challenging the church to go to people that you have historical animosity against. You know, the church has been known for very harsh rhetoric against the so-called LGBT community. Jesus would challenge us to love them, preach the gospel to them. The church has historically been divided by race. You have black church, white church, Hispanic church. Now, if they only speak Spanish, that's normal, right? Chinese, Korean. But Jesus challenges us to transcend the ethnic differences, the ethnic polarity, the historic racism, and go to people that we normally wouldn't want to hang out with. We would normally not have anything to do with. Maybe you're a, a really staunch Republican. Love Democrats. Love people who voted for Joe Biden. That's what he would be saying. That's Samaria. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. <laughs> and then he says, I want you to go to the ends of the world. Wow! That was even more crazy to a Jew. He's calling us to go to Nations that practice cannibalism, uh, sacrificing their children to Molech, like modern-day abortion, just saying. Um, the polytheistic nations that practice witchcraft, like the Celtic Druids, who would have, uh, you know, they would inflict curses and use potions to get their way and control the environment. And St. Patrick would go and have power encounters against people like that. That's how he was able to preach the gospel. He proved that Jesus is greater than the witchcraft of the Druids. And that's why the Irish wind up getting converted and helping to civilize the rest of Western Europe. A powerful story. And so Jesus called them to be cultural anthropologists. I want you to study languages. I want you basically by implication, how are you going to preach and be a witness if you don't speak the same language? So that was a huge challenge, a huge throwdown. I want you to go to the ends of the earth. Now remember, he's talking to Jews who thought it was unclean just to have dinner with a Gentile. And he's telling them, I want you to go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. What a challenge. So that was also a leadership challenge because how could 12 apostles possibly go to all the nations of the earth. So by implication, he was commanding them to reproduce apostolic leaders generationally and disciples that would eventually permeate every aspect of culture. How many are following me so far? So Acts 1, verse 8 and 9, it transcends a lot more than just merely speaking in tongues. There's a lot there, and I could spend days talking about each one of these aspects of this uh, Acts 1, 8 and 9 periscope. So as we go on in Acts chapter 1, they waited in the upper room. Jesus commanded them again in part one of this narrative to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until, somebody say until. Today we don't know what it's like to tarry. Today we don't know what it's like to wait on God until there's an answer. In this quick fix microwave culture, we think we could just name it and claim it, and God's just a butler waiting on us. And if it doesn't happen right away, we get all discouraged. But he said, wait. And so what did they do? They didn't know when the answer was going to come. Eventually, they wound up having a 10-day prayer meeting from the time of Jesus' ascension into heaven after 40 days after his resurrection until the day of Pentecost, which means 50. We could note that it was about 10 days. Imagine a 10-day prayer meeting. We could hardly get people out to pray for 40 minutes, for a half hour. 
Uh, you'd think that we're asking someone to commit Harry Carey if they pray with you for 10 minutes. Imagine, they were in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane and they couldn't even wait for one hour without falling asleep. But if you're watching the Seattle Seahawks, you're like, hey, man, hallelujah. Oh, did you see that? What about the prayer meeting? <sighs> <sighs> Some of y'all were up for, for six hours watching an 18-inning game that was for naught. But to pray, imagine, they prayed for 10 days. Somebody say 10 days. Shut up on that, boo. That's getting Pentecostal, 10 days. I could imagine the early days of Azusa, them waiting on God for 10 days. But today, it's, we're not functionally Pentecostal anymore. We're more functional, almost atheistic the way we live, or agnostic, because we don't really believe that it's worth our time to give God our time to wait on him. They waited on God for 10 days, not knowing it could have been 10 years. They just were waiting. And of course, we know what happened. After a series of 10 days, which didn't just include prayer, prayer was the primary function, but we also know they compared scripture. Peter stood up in the midst of them, and he quoted, I think it was Psalm 69, and he said, uh, the word of God talks about replacing Judas, and he uh, brought up how we need to choose somebody who is with us from the beginning as a witness of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, a witness of his passion, and so they chose Matthias by Lot, and the reason why they use Lot Lots is because the Spirit wasn't in them yet. You don't ever see that methodology later on after the Spirit came upon them where they could hear from God. Uh, uh, but we do believe that there's different methods that God uses based on the place we are at in our life. And so they waited on God for 10 days, which included prayer, which included comparing Scripture, probably dialogue, and the reason why they had so much time together uh, and needed so much time together was because now they had to interpret the gospel post-ascension. They were used to the gospel of Jesus Christ while he was with them for three and a half years. They were preaching the gospel. And the gospel is not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's Jesus himself, because we see in Mark chapter 1, it was the beginning of the gospel. Now... That was before anybody even knew he was going to die. So the gospel is not just the last six hours of Jesus on the cross. The gospel is Jesus. We have to study the life of Jesus, mimic his life, not just claim, oh, you know, I believe in the finished work of Christ. I'm his righteousness. I'm his wisdom. That's where most evangelicals are at. But whoa, whoa, whoa. We're supposed to mimic his life, not just claim the finished work on the cross, right? Still, it's like microwave Christianity, in a sense. Are you still with me here? And so they were waiting on God, dialoguing so that they could interpret the gospel in light of the post-ascension glorified Christ. And so they needed some time to debrief. They went from denying Christ to now walking with the exalted Christ who is reigning out of heaven. And, wow, what was really going on was they were going from uh, basically having temporal unity based on a common cause to now having oneness, oneness of heart, oneness of mind. God could not launch the church with a kingdom divided against himself or people on different pages. They had to be one. And so notice the term in Acts 1.13, they were of one accord, praying constantly. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind and cloven tongues of fire fell on everyone who was assembled. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And uh, immediately they were given that baptism that enabled them to communicate the gospel to people of different languages and different cultures. Unfortunately, the church didn't learn that. But the power 
was to give them the ability to interpret the gospel to different cultures. It wasn't just to speak in tongues. It was to speak the language of God to humans who never heard of God before, which means that if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you could trust God to witness to agnostics, to atheists, to gay, to straight, to Muslims, to Buddhists. Do you understand what this means? It was giving us a universal bridge to every human being. It was the divine connected to the anthropos. The uh, gospel is the greatest bridge known to man to bring the world under the lordship of Christ, something that the Roman Empire tried to do through emperor worship. They failed which is why it says in Ephesians 3.10 that God, through the church, showed his wisdom to the principalities and powers. What did that mean? That what Rome failed to do, God was able to do through the church where he brought slave and free and ethnic people and women and children, transcended any one tribe and nation. He brought them together under the lordship of Christ. And if there's anything that God wants to accomplish through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he wants us to be bridge builders to every human. That's the power. That's where God gets the glory. Does this make sense? And we see as a result of that, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost. He preached. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And, uh, and then he talked about how times of refreshing would come. He said, save yourself from this perverse generation. And he said, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. He's not talking about geographic. He's talking about it's a generational gospel. You should hand down to your children and your children's children. The Spirit of God is promised to save a, a generation of your family so that we create family dynasties, not just church gatherings on Sunday, but it should affect your family. It is, should perpetuate a generational blessing in your bloodline. That's what it's talking about. So the promise of the Spirit is to our family. 3,000 responded, and we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, immediately they put them through a process, a catechetical process, or if you're Roman Catholic, you remember they went through catechism. Uh, it just means the teaching. People became what's called catechumens. Uh, before they were baptized, they went through a process of teaching. And so in Acts 2.42, it says they submitted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the breaking of bread, to the koinonia, or the fellowship, and to the prayers. Corporate prayer was essential to someone becoming a disciple. They couldn't imagine somebody who didn't have a prayer life being a disciple. We see the word disciple was not mentioned again because they're all new Christians that had to go through this process of catechesis until chapter 6, verse 12, where the number of disciples increased. It took them several months before they were just not only known as believers, but disciples. We see the power of prayer there. Emphasize in Acts 2.42, we see in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were going to the temple during the time of prayer. We know from church history and from Hebrew history that they had corporate prayer three times a day whenever anybody was able to do it, 9 a.m., 12, and then 3. So during the time of prayer, that means the church kept a sort of liturgical calendar in terms of prayer, corporate devotions. Now it's hard to get people out once a week for an hour. My God, three times a day. Of course, they lived in the same community. There was no cars, airs, uh, planes, trains, automobiles. But uh, now we could use conference calls, Zooms. But anyway, they went to the temple. And we see here how God honors even the attempt to pray. God sets you up when you discipline your life with the spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and uh, reading the scriptures and singing the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, which the early church called Lectio Divina, where the scriptures were to be part of our life, not just a uh, daily bread devotional once a day. And while they were going to the temple, it tells us that they met a beggar and he wanted something from them. And Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, it wasn't because they were naming it and claiming it or like Jesus' name is some magic wand, but because they walked with God. They were able to say, I have Jesus. I'm a witness, not just what I preach. I'm walking with him. I could bring out the power of that name. And of course, the man rose up and walked. He leaped and uh, caused the revival. People from all over the place started coming. What would have happened if they weren't disciplined in prayer? That would have never taken place. So even the attempt to pray, I mean, God knows what you need even before you pray, right? But just attempting to pray sets you up to be at the right place at the right time. Isn't that powerful? That's how much God honors prayer. We see in chapter 4, after they were persecuted, uh, they came together and they counted themselves so grateful that they were worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And they began a corporate prayer meeting. And they didn't pray, oh God, slay these religious Jews. Oh God, kill our uh, antagonists. Uh, it, it was a shame. Recently I heard that some Christian leaders were actually praying in precatory prayers against people who they thought stole the election. Show me that in the Bible. Jesus said, pray for those who hurt you, who despitefully use you. Jesus overrid imprecatory prayers in the Old Testament and brought out a new line of God's grace so that we would love our enemies and do good to them. And, and so what did they do? They never prayed against the Romans or the Jews, but they prayed by quoting Psalm 2, uh, uh, Lord, uh, they, they, they've set themselves up, the kings, Herod and Pilate, against your anointed one. And then they prayed and said, Lord, give us boldness. Give us boldness to preach the word of God. That was the way God was pleased. We saw in the past two years, thousands and thousands of hours praying for our candidate to get elected where tells us in Second Chronicles, the key to seeing your land healed is by seeking God's face, not by praying for elections. You read Second Chronicles 7.14 when you have a chance. Here they were praying for gospel boldness. They never focused on their enemies. They focused on themselves and their own weaknesses. Give us boldness. We know we're fragile. We know we're weak. And God was so pleased that the Spirit came upon them and they spoke the word of God with boldness, and the house that they were meeting in was shaken. We need some houses shaking, huh? Amen. We need our house, our temple to be shaken. We see in chapter 6 when they were neglecting the widows who were only able to speak Greek. So there was prejudice even in the early church, linguistic prejudice, those who were Hellenized or who were uh, accustomed and assimilated into Greek culture instead of Hebraic culture, they didn't want to serve them food. And so Peter, he could have responded in uh, panic and he could have said, oh my God, here's another crisis. The first crisis is what are we going to do with 3,000 people who came in? Well, they wound up sharing their houses, their homes, sold homes like Barnabas did. Uh, it wasn't practicing communism. That what they were doing is practicing, man, the gospel is worth more than our personal goods. And if we're going to really take this serious, we have to give up everything to accommodate all these people. They didn't go back to their homes. They had no place to live. And they were able to devote themselves to the apostles' doctrine because of the generosity of the church. And now they had another crisis. Peter could have said, okay, all of us apostles, let's just... Fill in the gap until we can figure out what to do. Let's wait on tables now. But Peter said, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God in prayer. They knew that the greatest call that the leaders of the church have is vertical, more than horizontal. Like what Jethro said to Moses in Exodus 18, verse 19, he said, you be Godward, and then hear from God, and then Delegate to elders of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. And the primary call of a man of God, the leading of a church, is to wait on God and to uh, 
be that visionary, that conduit. And as Peter said, I'm not going to neglect the word of God and prayer. And because of that, it says that the number of disciples multiplied and even a lot of priests became obedient to the faith, Acts chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. We see Acts chapter 9, after meeting Christ on the road to Damascus, what did Paul do, the one who sat under the eminent scholar Gamaliel? He understood the importance of fasting and prayer. He didn't eat. He fasted and prayed for three days until Ananias saw a vision of a man praying and fasting, and he went. What would have happened if Paul would have sneered at Jesus and ignored what happened and just went about his duties? Well, he would have never been the apostle. And He fasted and prayed in response to that. We need to fast and pray. If we don't see what's going on to our children and our nation and what's going on, even most importantly to our churches, compromising the word of God to accommodate culture. My God, if that doesn't cause us to fast and pray, I don't know what will. And then we see in chapter 10, Cornelius was a man who feared God. He was uh, not a Jew. He was not an official covenant, but he was a man who feared God. God fearers were people who didn't yet convert to Judaism, but they uh, worshiped with them. They went to the feasts. They didn't get circumcised, but they did everything else with them because they believed in the God of Israel. And so the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said that his prayers and his benevolence has come up as a memorial before God. He was a man of prayer. While he was praying, an angel came. And the rest is history. The gospel went to Cornelius, his whole family. And because of his prayer life and Peter's prayer life, because when they were cooking for Peter, we find in Acts 10, he wasn't on his cell phone looking at sports. He went on the roof praying. And he suddenly became a part of a trance. He went into a trance and the Lord showed him not to call anything unclean that God has called clean, preparing him to preach the gospel to a non-Jew. We see in Acts chapter 12, when Peter was arrested, they had already beheaded James. They were about to kill Peter. And prayer went up unceasingly for him in John Mark's house. The mother, uh, uh, his mother Mary prayed without ceasing until God delivered him with an angel. Chapter 13, the elders of the church of Antioch, which formed because of the persecution they went about preaching the word everywhere they went. And what did they do? It says, and the elders, the pastors, and the teachers, the prophets, were ministering to the Lord and fasting. Then God said, set apart, apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work we're into. I've called them. What would have happened if they weren't ministering to the Lord and fasting? Paul may have never been sent out as an apostle and changed the known world. See, Acts chapter 16 Paul and uh, Silas, I believe it was, were looking for a place of prayer similar to Acts 3. They just had the attitude of prayer. They wanted to live in that realm of spiritual discipline. Perhaps it was one of the three times of day, 9, 12, or 3. We don't know. But they went to a riverside that they assumed would be a place of prayer. And there they met Lydia. And they shared the gospel with her. And God opened her heart. And she founded the first church in Western Europe. She opened up a house church that eventually went to the whole of Europe. Isn't that powerful? Again, the connection between prayer and the expansion of the gospel. We see the same thing in Acts 18 where there was a lot of persecution in the city of Corinth. And while Paul was praying, God appeared to him in a vision and a dream and said, don't be afraid because I got a lot of people in this city. Fast forward to Acts chapter 27. Paul was in a ship that uh, was about to be a shipwreck, and they were just wandering for months in the uh, various uh, seas, the Adrian Sea and other seas, and people were afraid they're going to die. And I'm assuming Paul was praying because it says that in the middle of the night, an angel of the Lord came to him and told him, God has given you everybody who's sailing with you. And he had the word of the Lord to bring comfort 
and direction to all those men that were on the ship. Finally, in Acts chapter 28, we find that after they landed at the island of Malta, which still has a very strong Christian presence and understands the history of the gospel, starting with Paul, if you go there, it says that Publius' father, the leader of the whole island, was sick with dysentery. And it says that Paul prayed, and after prayer, he laid hands on his father. His father got healed, and a healing revival broke out. And the gospel went and Christianized the whole island because of the power of the resurrection. This was a quick snapshot of the importance of prayer, of how prayer precedes every move of God. My question to you is, how important is prayer to you personally? How important is corporate prayer to you? And how important is corporate prayer to developing oneness? We have unity here today. Everybody's here because they want to be in church together. You have unity, but unity is only temporary. People watching the Seahawks uh, today, they have unity. Even though some might be voting Democrats, some Republican, for three hours they are in unity. But when they leave, they hate each other. The racists all love each other. They're rooting for the same team. We have to go beyond unity. Some of you are here on Sunday every week, but you're in unity on Sunday. But are you one with the vision of the house? Are you connected with your heart, mind, and soul? Do you volunteer? Do you pray for your pastor and your leaders? Do you give generously? Do you lay down your life for the gospel? Are you functionally a member or just a member in title? God has called us to go from unity to oneness. Unity is the process. Oneness is the product. Unity is temporary. Oneness is eternal. God has called us to an eternal brotherhood and sisterhood as sons and daughters of Christ. There's no greater power than corporate prayer to unite our souls and our spirits, even as we pray for one another, bear one another's burdens as we mimic the life of Christ. Those of you who want to be people of prayer and those of you who want to be one, with not only Christ, but with his body. The church is the visible body of the invisible Christ. You can't separate the bride from the husbandman. People talk against the church are talking against Jesus. When Paul was persecuting the church, Jesus said to him in Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who? How am I persecuting you? Who are you? I am Jesus. We have to love his church if we really love him. Let's stand up as we close. We want to pray. How many of you would say, I want to be a person of prayer? How many of you want to take serious corporate prayer? When we call for corporate prayer in the church, I don't know what the rhythm is here, if it's once a week or other times or before the service or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure of the rhythm of the house. But I plead with you in the name of the Lord that you would be committed to that. So, Father, we thank you that you've called us to pray even as your prophetic voice who is now in glory Leonard Ravenhill said Sunday morning shows how popular the church is Sunday night how popular the guest speaker is but the prayer meeting shows how popular God is Father we pray that you would be popular that you would be the one we live for that you would pour out a spirit of prayer and supplication Oh, God. Oh, God. How many of you would want to consecrate yourself as a person of prayer? If you would, and hopefully I'm not messing up at the time, but just come up here. Just show God that you want to be consecrated to prayer.
going to give it over to Pastor Ben now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We acknowledge as we walk through your word in the book of Acts that prayer is not our thing that we do. It's the gift that you give to bring us together to initiate your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, we do. We consecrate ourselves for the work of prayer and we deny every ideology or false theology that suggests that prayer does nothing. We deny that today in Jesus' name. And we push back against that thought, Lord, that stronghold. We pray that you would break the power of anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and the truth that we've discussed today, that prayer is powerful, that as we ask you, as we beseech you, as we come to you, you will respond. You answer our prayers and our cries as we align ourselves with your will. Father, we ask that you would set us apart for the work of prayer. I ask you, Lord, that you would remind us in the morning that you would wake us up, Lord, and I pray that we would have time before we go to bed, that we would gather together, not just sometimes, but more often than we ever have. Lord, we pray that at this time, that you would bring us together for the work of prayer. And then out of that would come obedience. Out of that would come all that you desire for the glory of Christ. Father, we ask you not to be a people that talk about it, that have aspirational values, that think it's a good idea, that hope one day we get around to it, that when we're not as busy or we don't have to raise our kids, but Lord, somehow we would find a way to prioritize the place of prayer and the secret place, the gathering place, and you would pour out your spirit upon us to do that. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding according to your will today to do just that. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to move from prayer being our lifeline to prayer being our life's blood. It would be what we do. It's what we do. And we believe that you hear us and that you respond to us in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Come on, can we get a, give a shout to God today? Believe that God's calling us to pray. And can we also thank Pastor Joseph as well as he's come and ministered to us? Yeah, praise the Lord. Um, here's, the, here's the thing as I just sort of commission us to go is that we were at a leader conference this last weekend for our, our denomination, and we were sitting as a staff. And I, in August of 2020, I believe the Lord gave me a burden for prayer. He actually spoke to me very clearly in the midst of all that we were going through uh, with COVID and, and just the confusion and all the political polarization and um, racial tension and all of that. You know, just being honest, like I didn't know what to say or do half the time. In fact, I just was getting it wrong all the time. And so I prayed, amen. I fasted and I took my three week vacation time to just pray and, and with my family, cause we just didn't know what to do. And I remember the Holy Spirit directed me specifically and said, there is a mandate on this house and on your life to not just lead revival, but to lead prayer and to move towards corporate prayer. And so we did that. We started three prayer times for an hour long. And we've been doing that. And we, we started with a few people in the prayer meeting and I get excited when there's 10 and 15 and 20. And, and it's not my push to legalistically get everybody to do what I want. But I am saying, as we were meeting this last week as a staff during the leader conference, one of our staff members who's here to, today in this meeting said, why do you think people don't uh, pray as much. And I said, because I think something has seduced us into believing that nothing happens when we pray. And the Bible calls that a stronghold in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And Paul said, right, to the, we have power to break down strongholds and strongholds are houses made of thoughts. And he wants to pull that card. When we pray, it is not inactivity. That's a cultural, secular thought because we're praying to the all-powerful one. It's his kingdom come and it's his will be done. 
And friends, I wanna encourage you, if you have somehow bought into the lie that when we pray, nothing happens, if the next thing that comes out of your mouth or to your mind when we say we need to pray, yeah, and we need to do stuff as well. That's not untrue, but the fact is, is that we are underemphasizing where we are at in the place of prayer. I am telling you as a pastor for almost 20 years, there is something that has happened to the body of Christ in this area of prayer and God is restoring it. And as he restores it, we are going to see the power of God released. I can guarantee you that by the word of God, if we become a house of prayer for all the nations, I believe the power of God that we are longing for and looking for will be released in a way we have never seen before. It's not our intellect. It's not how great we are. It's not how awesome we do things. It's the power of God released through prayer, our trusting him with all of our life. And you know what's awesome about that? Anybody can do it. Anybody can pray. It's just our we. So let me pray you out of this service in Jesus' name, because we have to conclude. We have kids bouncing off walls right now. Father, thank you for this place of prayer. What a privilege it is that we might not have an audience with kings and people of high stature. We may not know anybody in high arenas, but we have an audience with God. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear us and you respond to us when we pray in accordance with your will. And so I ask you that you would restore to us the biblical reality that prayer is powerful because of who we're talking to. And so we say your kingdom come, your will be done in Northwest Church, in Federal Way, in this nation, and in your world, on earth as it is in heaven, in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, amen. amen. Come on, amen, in Jesus' name. As you, as you go today, we're gonna have our pastors and prayer ministers, they're gonna be up front. If you need prayer, we would love to pray with you. Otherwise, we would love to see you and connect after service. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us today. We are on mission with Jesus to see the lost saved and disciples made. If you are in need of prayer or you want to get more connected with Northwest Church, visit nwcfoursquare.org and fill out a connect card. We will follow up with you this week and our staff will pray over every prayer request that we receive. Download our church app, read sermon notes, watch past messages, and follow along with our Bible reading plan. Search for Northwest Foursquare Church in your app store.